Hey US History, uh, welcome to lesson number one of our virtual learning journey. Um, I miss you guys, I wish we were all in the classroom. Uh, it's going to be very strange to be teaching all of these lessons with so few interruptions. Um, however, hopefully we'll all be able to be back together again soon and until then this is a as good a substitute as any as we can get for the actual classroom time. Um, so today we are going to start chapter 16 which is talking about the Gilded Age. Um, and so we just, if you recall from forever ago, uh, we just finished Grant's administration. It was very corrupt, um, destroyed any semblance of um, unity, uh, really demolished reconstruction attempts. And so you have all of those really inhumane black codes going on, all of the voting laws, the different taxes that are really messing up the South. Um, but in this chapter, we're focusing on really all the stimulation to the economy that happens in, um, the later 1800s. Okay. So if you're following along in your book, we're starting on page 333 and today we are going to cover from page 333, um, all the way through page 341. And so I'm going to do it kind of quickly. Uh, know that feel free to slow down the videos, to go back, um, to move things around as you need, but I don't want any of these videos to get too long because that's not going to be very entertaining for you. Um, after you're done watching this video, you're going to go to today's Juno pod. It's 10 questions. Um, they are from the book, uh, if you are following along in your book, uh, but they're all based around today's video lesson and today's book lesson. So in theory, if you don't have your book, you're still able to complete, uh, the Juno pod. Okay. Um, so let's get started. Uh, let's talk about industry and invention. So industrialism. Uh, the post-war period, so especially we're talking post-Civil War, um, it's got this huge rise in the importance of industry. And so there's really four reasons why America is able to undergo industrial growth, okay? Um, okay, so reason number one. Uh, reason number one is that the nation itself is growing, okay? Okay. So your population is growing, uh, specifically because post-war you have a baby boom. Um, and so you have a lot of babies being born. Um, and so when the nation's population itself is growing, that helps its industry grow as well. Uh, reason number two is because there's this general innovative spirit of the times. Um, and so this innovative spirit uh, takes place because you've got all this new growth. And so you've got these new machines and um, new inventions and new, you know, cultures because you have a rise in immigration as well. Um, and so these entrepreneurs are experimenting with the telegraph, the telephone, the radio, all of these new innovations. Um, reason number three is a government that's sympathetic to the interests of business. Um, so if a government is not, sorry, sympathetic to business interests, Governments can focus on multiple different things. Um, and this particular set of governments passed a lot of high tariff laws. And if you'll recall, tariffs means that you don't want to be importing goods because your imported goods are gonna cost more. So it encourages uh, localized industry. And so the government's really helping out reducing foreign um, competition, this increase in, um, in, in inexpensive workforce because you have a lot of immigrants coming and the immigrants say, we don't care what we do, we don't care how much we make, we just need a job. Um, and so you have a very cheap labor force, which is not necessarily a good thing for them, but it's very good for your businesses. Um, and so that creates a lot of workforce for your employers. And then finally, you have these new sources of power. And in your sources of power, um, you're able to create new things. So you've got oil, you've got electricity for the first time. Um, and in creating these new sources, sources of power, you're able to really increase how much of things that you can do. Think about like an electrically powered um, crank versus one that you have to hand crank over and over and over again. The electric one's gonna be able to do a lot more, a lot faster. 
Um, so now we're going to talk about uh, captains of industry versus robber barons. Okay. Now your book is more sympathetic to the captains of industry. However, many historians debate whether or not these men were truly captains, which as it might imply is a good thing, or robber barons, which is a bad thing. Um, now they were aggressive, they were cost and efficiency conscious, um, and in some ways these men were able to do a lot of good for the consumers, but in some ways this really hurt taxpayers, other um, entrepreneurs, and these people definitely could have been seen as taking advantage of other people, which is why they were sometimes known as robber barons. Um, like I said, they were aggressive. Uh, they definitely had some really hard tactics, uh, but they did what they needed to do to make it work. So you've got basically two categories. You've got market entrepreneurs and political entrepreneurs. So market would be anybody that has to do with the production of goods, services. Political has to do with any political reformation in the government. Um, so political success through special privileges, political advantages, whereas your market uh, has much more to do with services to the little guy, okay? So you have your market and your political entrepreneurs. Um, now, a couple people that we'll go through real quick. You've got Cornelius Vanderbilt, who was all about shipping. Cornelius Vanderbilt borrowed $100 from his mother and started a ferry service. Um, now keep in mind $100 was more back then, but still, that's not much. Um, from this humble beginning, he was able to gain control of much of New York's um, water system. Okay, so some of your men, you've got Cornelius Vanderbilt. And he has everything to do with shipping. Now, another guy whose name uh, you probably haven't necessarily heard of, but it's James J. Hill. And his industry was railroads. James J. Hill um, gained his fortune in railroads. He got very rich. Uh, he started with a job in a grocery store and in 1856 tried to start a shipping business, got a clerk, became an expert uh, in economics, and founded his own company, the James J. Hill Company. Um, he bought land and innovated by shifting from wood fuel to coal. Um, and so that was big, remember? We talked about the new sources of power being a reason why you have industrial growth. And this is a new source of power. You're going from wood to coal. Coal is much more powerful than wood and burns for longer. Um, now, he said, we want the shortest distance, the lowest grade, the least curvature. We need the best railroads. Um, his is interesting because he didn't take a single penny of government money or influence. He did it all on his own and prospered immensely and really helped shape the population um, in the north. Uh, Midwest. Then you have another guy, Andrew Carnegie. You may have heard that name before. So Andrew Carnegie was a pioneer in the steel industry. Um, and Carnegie, he was a bobbin boy at a textile mill, meaning that he worked in a mill, a very, a very dangerous position. Um, and because of his ability, he began to rise through the ranks, became superintendent, and was on the lookout for better ways to organize um, through a method known as something called vertical integration. So vertical integration, um, which is he controlled every aspect of the steel production from the mine to the market. So he didn't buy steel that was mined from somebody else and then sell it to somebody else for mass production. He was actually in charge of and controlled and owned the mines, the factories, and controlled the market that steel was sold on. Um, and so this vertical integration, vertical because he controlled all levels, so from the mines all the way up to the market, um, he had so much control and really changed the way businesses wanted to own things. He established what was called a monopoly because really he was the only person who controlled steel. And so as we've talked about in the past, um, like the game Monopoly, a monopoly is when you own everything. And so you have control over the prices, which is another way that some people call these men robber barons because they had control over the prices. They could raise the prices and nobody could stop them. Moving on to another guy, you've got John D. Rockefeller.
and John D. Rockefeller was a pioneer in the field of oil. Um, and so he founded a company called Standard Oil Company, which you might have heard of because they still, in some ways, exist. Um, and so he basically was religious about working, saving his money. He invested $4,000 in his company, which was even more at the time, um, entered the oil industry and actually made it more efficient. So basically before Rockefeller, uh, when they would mine, um, when they would get oil, only about half of the oil that they got was able to be used. And Rockefeller figured out a way to use the other half, which increased profits exponentially. Um, and so he organized his oil refining empire into what's called a trust. And so that's his big thing, a trust. Now, a trust is a legal device by which a board of trustees is empowered to make decisions on a whole group of companies. So what he did was Rockefeller also established a monopoly by buying 27 competing oil companies and created a trust where basically he and a group of trustees were in charge of every single oil company. And so he's also creating a monopoly on a lot of these things. Uh, the image that most people have of him today is that he was a callous and cutthroat competitor um, because he in some ways was. Your book is rather sympathetic to him, but I disagree a little bit. I think that he was rather cutthroat. Um, now, this is helped along by um, a woman named Ida Tarbell, who was a journalist, and it was her father's company was one of the first ones that Rockefeller bought. So, of course, she hated him because she, basically he bought out her father's company and took away all of his wealth and thought that it was illegal and immoral. And so she definitely painted him as a really nasty guy in all of her articles that she wrote. Um, but you can decide for yourself whether or not he was a good guy or a bad guy. Um, now, there's a really helpful chart in your book on horizontal versus vertical immigration. I'll hold that up for anybody that doesn't have their book right now. Um, and it just goes through the differences of companies that use horizontal in, in, um, sorry, horizontal integration or vertical integration. Most of these people that have monopolies used vertical integration because they owned all aspects of everything. Okay. Now to move on, uh, we'll talk about two more guys, James Buchanan Duke. Okay. I'll move this up a little bit. So you've got... And Duke was a pioneer in the field of tobacco. Now, you may ask, how can you be a pioneer in the field of tobacco? Well, he wanted to create a new South that would match the North in its um, economic capacity. So you remember um, during the Civil War, one of the North's big strengths was its economic capacity, how much it could produce, how many goods it could make, the fact that they could, quite frankly, make more guns and more tents and more uniforms than the South could. This is still the case. The South has not benefited from Reconstruction economically. Um, and so James Buchanan Duke really wants to help grow the South into a better economic product. And through his use of advertising and promotion, he founded the American Tobacco Company, which captured 90% of the cigarette market. 90%. Um, he also became a leader in developing hydroelectric power, which is using water, hydro, to power electricity. Um, so he created this new South model of trying to increase the South's productivity. And then the last person we're going to talk about is J.P. Morgan, who was a pioneer in the field of finance. So finance, money. John Pierpoint Morgan, also known as J.P. Morgan, um, was the leading investment banker. And he was actually the person who formed the first billion dollar corporation, United States Steel Corporation. Now, steel, yes, steel was Carnegie. J.P. Morgan was actually able to buy Carnegie Steel Company. Um, this is after Carnegie has passed, I believe. Um, and so he's passed away. Morgan buys his company and actually amasses the first billion dollar company. So Morgan was the first billionaire, essentially. Uh, and that's United States Steel Corporation. And I will zoom in on my whiteboard at the end so that you can see everything. Now, um, okay, so moving on to some other innovations. 
um, innovations uh, have to do with diet, uh, dress code. Um, now people are creating, like, they're cooking different ways. Um, and so you've got this new production of cans. Now you're allowed to preserve food. Now you're able to preserve food. Um, so you can preserve things that would otherwise go bad, like dairy or meats or things like that. Um, you also have changing of your dress because of the invention of the sewing machine. Um, okay, so some innovations. We've got food refrigerator cars. Cars being not cars as in automobiles that you would drive, but cars as in train cars. So you have refrigerated cars that can transport beef and pork all across the country now. You don't just have to get your meat locally. Um, and then you've got, like I said, the tin cans and new methods of cooking. Um, for clothing, you have the invention of the sewing machine. which is a really big deal because now they don't have to sew all of their clothes by hand. Um, and so that creates, it, it means that people can own more than two sets of clothing because it makes clothing cheaper because it's easier to make. Um, so you've got that going on and that's really changing everything. Um, by 1920, a woman's dress only required three yards of material as opposed to it used to require 10 yards of material. So your dresses are getting smaller, they're getting cheaper, they're getting much more accessible. Um, now we're almost done. So to finish up, let's talk about communications and electricity. Um, communications, you've got the typewriter. Um, you've got this continuous action uh, roller press and shorthand to create new things in the business world. But most importantly, you have the telephone. And the telephone was invented by Alexander Graham Bell. Okay, so communication. And the telephone is very exciting uh, because now you can talk to people who aren't right next to you. So that again is Alexander Graham Bell. And he invents the telephone and this just changes everything. Um, he created the first phone call by calling um, someone else in his house, uh, <laughs> in his very own home. And that was the first phone call. Uh, he called his um, assistant he said, Mr. Watson, come here. I want you. Um, and his assistant was incredibly surprised to hear his boss on the other end of the line. But ever since then, we've been using our telephones. Um, and then lastly, talking about electricity. Um, uh, obviously, your biggest electrical giant is this guy named Thomas Edison. You may know him as the guy who invented the light bulb, specifically the incandescent light bulb. Okay. So the incandescent light bulb was an invention of Thomas Edison's, but he also um, created several other things as well. He also invented the phonograph, uh, which played music, um, among other things. Um, and he invented the motion picture projector. So now for the first time you can project um, pictures, moving pictures onto something. It's a big deal because this is the beginning of movies. Um, and then you had a couple of other inventors, George Westinghouse, uh, Nikola Tesla, um, and they create alternative current generators um, and transformers, which give electrical power long range practicality. So now you've got um, power that's being generated from everything from electricity to Niagara Falls, and that lights up places in Chicago. Um, so the world's becoming connected and electricity becomes a really big deal. Okay, so that is our lesson for today. Um, that's the gist. I know that was a little fast. I know it was a lot of information, but feel free. Um, the good thing about a video is you can stop, pause, go back, rewatch. Um, I'll take a moment and I'll zoom in on all of my notes for you. Um, so I can't quite see all of it, but this is the Gilded Age. Kind of move down so you get to see all of it. Okay, cool. Well, from here, you should have all the information that you need in order to complete your Junopod assignment. And that is your only assignment for today. Um, I look forward to talking to you guys virtually again tomorrow. Have an awesome day.